Okay, so here's make code. What is make code? Well, you can go to this URL and find a web app. So the web app there in the center is all written in TypeScript. And what it has at the top are two editors. You can edit in Blockly or using Monaco JavaScript, but really you're programming in a subset of TypeScript that is designed for efficient compilation down to machine code. And all that compilation happens in the browser. So for schools, this is great. They download a web app, they get a com an editor, a debugger, a compiler to machine code linking against a pre-compiled C++ runtime. And so we designed this in particular uh, with the BBC in mind when we worked on something called the microbit. So this is a little computer that has three times less memory than my Apple II from 1981. This has 16K of RAM. And static TypeScript and make code targets this thing. And we have several million of these now distributed worldwide. And if you go to makecode.microbit.org, you'll see the editor. Uh, we also have something called the round board you see on the screen there. That's from Adafruit. That has a whopping 32 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, and we also target uh, Arduino style uh, uh, boards as well. So that's what make code is sort of operationally. What it is, uh, is a web app and a whole IDE for targeting microcontrollers, but really for beginners. Um, you, don't, you don't write in C++, but you get the benefits of some of the C++ at the bottom level. If you go to the Make Code page, you'll see it's about hands-on computing education. Arduino led the way in the, in the idea of bringing physical computing, like boards that are visible. You can actually see the CPU and the wires, as opposed to like iPhones and stuff, which we love, but you, you don't even really know there's a computer inside it. So these physical computers uh, are a way to engage many in uh, middle school and on up. And uh, the hands-on computing education that MakeCode offers is not just the editor and the hardware that comes from our partners, but also courses and projects and all sorts of things that involve uh, not just coding, but putting, putting the uh, micro bit into uh, a design of something, whether that's art or science. Um, but today, we're gonna tell you about the thing you see in beta in the lower right corner, and that's our latest uh, version called micro uh, called Make Code Arcade. So Arcade, uh, so a lot of us learned how to program back you know, on the Commodore or the Mega or the Apple II. We decided to put a screen uh, essentially on the small computer and make a retro computing device uh, and target that. So arcade.makecode.com is our newest, newest editor. It's for browser-based retro game development. Uh, again, the full uh, you'll see the full uh, e uh, editor execution debugging story. The entire game engine is written in static TypeScript. So unlike the micro bit where a lot of the runtime was written in C++, here the entire game engine is written in static TypeScript and uh, there's the GitHub for it. And furthermore, we, uh, we defined a reference design for the retro uh, gaming platform. So any hardware manufacturer who uh, manufactures a, a board with respect to that design that's compatible, uh, it'll just work with our website. And then we can compile, the games require a little bit more memory, uh, still under 100, and 100 kilobytes of RAM. So this little guy has, I think, 96 kilobytes and we run just fine there. Um, the retro device is 160 by 120 pixels, 15 colors. Oh, somebody's, somebody's playing the game already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, 15 colors plus transparency, four directional buttons, two action buttons, and a little sound generator. Uh, here's what the editor looks like. Uh, Holly will tell you more about the specific game, Planet Putt Putt, but when you hit download, the magic of the comp compilation from static TypeScript to machine code takes place in the browser, and you are given a selection of devices. So we now have, from Kittenbot, the Meow Bit, we have, uh, what do we have? We have from Adafruit, uh, we have uh, the Pi Badge, which is running, and we also have uh, the orange board here, uh, the yellow board, which is the BrainPad Arcade, and this has got a little battery pack on the back, so if I turn that baby on, you'll also see mm -hmm, Planet Pup Pup. So um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Holly. She's gonna tell you about her experience with Arcade uh, creating uh, Planet Pup Pup. Yeah. So, uh, as Tom said, I created Plan and Putt-Putt with one of my coworkers, Anson Horton, as part of a hackathon that they had for testing it out. Um, it was super fun, and so I want to actually show you what developing it was like and what we ended up with at the end of it. 
So here we are in the editor on the web page. Um, so in this editor, you can see the game loaded up on the side there. You can see some of our code. We wrote musical melodies. Um, this like squiggle line has to do with the type of waveform we have. We've got different custom art. I don't know if you can tell by the fact that my profile photo is not actually a photo, but is pixel art that I like art. Um, so there are different ways within here that you can actually edit the pixels. So this is editing pixels for a part of our um, hole in one, like where the flag is for golfing. Um, and that ended up being four different sprites. Uh, working within sort of the limitations of what we were allowed to do with this game, such as the 15 colors, made it really interesting. We ended up altering the palette through different hex code arrays uh, throughout the game um, to get something cool. And for this particular um, title screen here, I actually edited a byte array, like byte by byte, <laughs> to make that happen. Um, I edited it in a like uh, pixel editor and then ultimately had to edit it as the byte array as well. So that was kind of fun and exciting. Um, yeah, so we're going to take you back to the presentation and I'll talk a little bit about um, what kind of things we did in tips and tricks because I think all of you, there will be uh, later today a way to uh, check out downstairs make code, but you should totally go on your own and check out the website and try to make a simple game. Um, so here are some tips and tricks you can do to get going with that. One is assets, art, and music are a little bit tricky in games and they're incredibly important. But as I showed, you've got the pixel editor and now there's also a music editor, a melody editor within MakeCode. They're super easy to use. They're really similar to things like Beatbox if you've ever seen them. Um, the pixels, you're just clicking pixels. They even have like circle tools and things like that. And then for editing uh, music, they've got a nice little musical score where it's, uh, you're able to sort of click a tone and the pitch is higher up and then lower is a lower pitch. And then the um, time, you can change the BPM and have it flow across these notes that you just kind of click along. So really intuitive, even if you're not super apt at making art or music. Um, then you're able to code physics. So since we made this putt-putt golf game, we were able to do uh, different physics for friction or gravity. We could change gravity since it's in space if we wanted to so that the ball can fall at different speeds. Um, and we also wanted people to be able to sort of aim at goals that were in the sky. So it was really, really simple. You've got math. It's all like if you code in TypeScript, this will be super easy to convert to. Um, and there's also built in types. So we built off a sprite type, which already has X, uh, Y, Z locations that we can use and accelerations and such. Um, there is a docs website, so if you go to arcade.makecode.com slash developer, you will get special info on how to develop uh, when you're using the code side rather than the block coding side, which is for more beginner developers. Um, and that will help you out a lot with how to get started and start doing more advanced techniques with building the game. Um, there's definitely a lot of different things to decide when you're building the game. So I su would suggest as you're going through that developer list and the different tips on music or art or the actual like system of your game, what's your win condition, things like that, that you take notes and you make a plan before you jump into this. Um, you wanna make sure you, like with anything that you're coding, you have a laid out idea of what kind of classes you're gonna need, what kind of art you're gonna need so that you can have a more organized um, system of files at the end of this. And also don't develop on edge. Um, I made that mistake while I was doing this and I constantly had bugs <laughs> um, and it was causing me problems, but it was because of edge. And then I moved to Chrome and everything was better. So <laughs> I would just recommend that. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, like I said before, you can use um, offline tools if you wanna get really advanced with your art. Um, so there's things like pixelart.com, which are free. Um, and then you can convert with a tool um, from someone from the MakeCode team, your pixel art into uh, an array that can be used within MakeCode. Um, and then I use things like Beatbox for Melodies. But again, the editors within MakeCode are super easy. So if you're not trying to get crazy fancy with what you're doing, you can totally make all of this stuff in there. Like it exists in there, so you can make it in there. There's no limitations. Um, utilize animation. There's uh, the ability to animate your characters, animate things in the scene. Um, it takes up a bit of memory, but it's totally worth it. And there's an animation extension that will make it easier for you. And I think it makes the game a lot more alive and interesting. And then like I alluded to earlier, customizing your palette. 
Um, you're able to change your palette over time. So in all of these screenshots with these assets, we've got a specific 15 color palette going on um, that limited us to like greens, purples, and oranges, um, and then grays and white. Uh, however, we had also an instruction page in which I felt these colors weren't really uh, legible enough. And so we ended up using a different palette for the instruction page on like what buttons to use. Um, and then there was a specific palette for the title screen because it didn't use uh, certain greens and purples in here or gray and white. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I got as many layers of purple as I could uh, in order to do a nice gradient in the background. So you can utilize uh, custom palettes in that way. The last tip I want to talk about um, before Tom goes more into how I was able to do all this through make code being implemented with uh, static TypeScript was the tile maps. Um, so this was something we decided to do, uh, Anson and I, was to make mini maps. Um, the maps, so this like little array you've got here of dots and numbers, these each represent a type of sprite. So again, you also get a limit on how many sprites you're allowed to have. Um, so the sprites you're allowed to have is 16. And so when working with these sprites, uh, we wanted to make sure that when we're making these arrays, we could make them as useful as possible. So we also converted these arrays to represent mini maps. So this represents the actual map. The ones are stars, the eights are ground. There's like a BAA9, which represents a meteor. Um, and then the like 46375 is the goal. Um, and then if we, that will create the whole larger map that the character plays on. And then also if the character presses B, we made it so that a mini map would pop up and instead these numbers would correlate to just colors on the screen in a basic way so that people could know where they were going um, when playing a different level. And we ultimately had three levels. Um, I turn, turns out I am terrible at this game. <laughs> I'm really bad at physics. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, so, but uh, Anson, who I made it with, is the only person who's ever beaten all three levels. So mm -hmm. I would challenge you to try and beat all three of our levels. The game is on the Make Code Arcade uh, homepage. And now I will turn it back over to Tom to talk about how this was implemented. Great. Thank you, Holly. Um, so constraints are really empowering, right? When you uh, write a program in Node or for the web browser, you have a lot of memory. But when you have to like get it to fit on this stuff, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit more a challenge. So thinking about these encoding tricks and learning about better ways to encode your data is, uh, is I think, really, really a core part of sort of learning some of the, the computing uh, experience. So make code. Uh, what do we do? Well, you, know, you might have noticed uh, we, we talked about Blockly. We talked about C++ as well as TypeScript. And so how do we bring all these things together? Um, well. We have, we use TypeScript really as the language to implement the web app, but we also use it as the way to bridge the gap between C++ at the bottom here uh, and the Blockly, the visual of drag and drop programming that you might know from scratch uh, at the top. And so we use uh, well-defined typed, fully typed interfaces in static TypeScript to define essentially the APIs for either the device or the game. And those APIs are then annotated with metadata to allow us to automatically generate blocks at the top, as well as provide a foreign function interface down to C++. So uh, we're, in my team, all language and compiler geeks, and every, every problem can be solved by writing essentially another compiler. So we have a compiler that takes annotated C++ and generates the static TypeScript definition files, declaration files, we have a compiler, obviously, from static TypeScript down to machine code to link against C++, pre-compiled C++. We have a compiler up from static TypeScript uh, into Blockly, and another uh, compiler down from Blockly to static TypeScript. Um, everything is done, again, inside the web app. There's no call out to a C compiler in the cloud. And that's because we need to run on pretty much any sort of uh, operating system with a modern web browser in a classroom where the computers are locked down. Um, and uh, static TypeScript, I think, is great because we get all of the classes in TypeScript. We get classes, interfaces, everything you need to teach uh, object-oriented programming. So you can start very simply with Blockly, but as a teacher, you can progress, you can progress uh, to teach object-oriented programming. Uh, abstractions. And then we have a C++ runtime for efficiency at the bottom. Uh, we actually support uh, coroutines with uh, non-preemptive scheduling. So there's a lot in the system uh, to make it go. Let me pop out to a demo 
And I'm going to choose a smaller program just to show you uh, what uh, the, uh, the, the various aspects that I just talked about. So this is a, this is a, uh, a program, uh, a little program for uh, having dinosaurs hop over rocks and cacti. Okay, so let's, let's see how that works. I think it's a one button game. Um, we press that and the whole thing hangs. There we go. There, raptor run. Okay, so press any button. Jump! Don't, don't die, don't die, don't die, don't die. No, 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 no. Okay, we died. All right, so what you can see here is, uh, is the uh, TypeScript, you know, for that code. And actually, this, this, was, this was programmed. Oh, no, no, don't, don't say it. Don't say it's true. Okay, it's gonna work anyway, great, it's perfect. Like I said, compilers everywhere, also <laughs> bugs. Okay, so, um, so we, we see that there are these blocks, these colorful blocks and these colorful categories. So you can do drag and drop programming and make code. Uh, and this is great for beginners. Uh, and there's a lot of research that shows that uh, using Blockly is much less intimidating than a text-based editor where you can have all these compiler errors and things. So that's a great way to get started. Uh, if we want to see sort of uh, the, the magic of the mappings, we can go back here and you can look, and this is for all the developers, uh, to see what's under the hood, right? And what's under the hood is a lot of static TypeScript and this stuff's annotated. So for example, I want to like, uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, scene, yeah. Okay. So scene, I see a namespace, I see some classes. See a lot of properties, big, big functions. Where is my metadata? Somewhere here, and this is probably the wrong one. I know one that has it. There, sprites. Okay, so sprites uh, have flags that tell you properties, and you see there's this funky metadata here. This is making the enum visible in Blockly. So Blockly has all sorts of widgets for selecting things and. Uh, and defining APIs. So the first thing we do is we can expose types into Blockly. Uh, we can also uh, expose a class. So here uh, we have some metadata ex exposing the class. We can choose certain methods that get exposed. And you don't have to, as a programmer uh, of a make code editor, you don't have to know about Blockly. You just use this metadata language uh, and we generate, uh, we generate the blocks for you. Uh, so that's a, that's a really uh, a big deal. If you want to see, we have a little pl playground that shows this off better in a very simple way. On the left-hand side, we have, for example, a move function that takes a number of steps. Uh, and we say, we want a block for that. And over on the right-hand side, we get a statement. So that's essentially what's happening. Um, the type declaration uh, is telling us that it should be a statement because it doesn't return a result. Uh, and it should have a hole for a number parameter because steps expects a number. Uh, here's a random number. What does random number look like in, in the scratch Blockly parlance? It's an oval because that function is returning a value. And so ovals can be put into expression contexts. So in fact, we can take the random number and we can pop it in there, right? So, so you see here how the types of uh, TypeScript are being used now for us to determine the, type, the kind of the blocks that will be generated. And uh, through static TypeScript we, and, and TypeScript in this metadata, we have a complete control over uh, the look and feel of the blocks as they appear uh, in the block editor that you saw. So that we, that's a great uh, way to design APIs that are simplifications of your TypeScript APIs if you want beginners uh, to start to work with your APIs. And this is something that's part and parcel of what we do in education because we need to sort of start with a very uh, low floor to, to get people started and then uh, they can progress from the blocks as you see into JavaScript. Uh, and you notice that, you might have noticed that I have the same categories in the blocks that I have in the JavaScript. So for example, here are my music tones. We talked about the music tones. I can take play sound uh, or loop sound. I can drag that out. I can put it at the beginning of the start. And I can go into JavaScript uh, and I can find play sound. It's somewhere down there. There it is, right? Um, and so we have, uh, again, compilers both ways. Most of, uh, most of what we can uh, code, uh, actually we convert everything. Um, many of the statements um, do, do not have editable representations in the block. So if we put a class in there and we go back, 
we, we see you, you get the class, but it's an uneditable block. So we can do a lot of TypeScript uh, in, in blocks, but not all of it, but we strive as much as possible to retain uh, the representation. Now, let me talk about the compilation down onto the device. Right now you see Holly's wonderful game, the Planet Pup Pup. We are gonna overwrite it, sorry, with uh, the Raptor run. And uh, the way we do that is we, uh, we're gonna hit download. I just wanna make sure um, I have the right board selected. So let me go there, change board, do the Pi badge, okay. Oh, and it's compiling already. Okay, so the compiler has started off. Um, it's compiling uh, not just the user program, but the whole game engine. Um, we currently have incremental compilation planning, so it's coming, but not quite there. Um, we compiled all the way to binary right now in the browser, and there it is. Now, how are we gonna get that binary, which is in the folder here, onto the device? We also wrote, uh, uh, designed, uh, open source, a file format uh, to make it very uh, speedy to flash a binary uh, onto, onto the device uh, by essentially masquerading uh, as a mass storage device. This is a trick that, um, uh, that ARM did with, with its embed dev boards and we've taken to the next level. So there's badge boot, there's the file, and there it is copying it, and the game is there, and if I hit the reset, doo -doo -doo -doo. reset button, one more time, oh, select. The game is there somewhere. Daryl, what do I do to start the game? <laughs> Something kind of cool also I'm just gonna throw in since yeah, we're, we're stalling for time. Um, <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we actually have this and a couple other games on like actual retro arcade machines in um, our office because you're able to download it onto various different devices. So there's like full arcade size ones um, and I've seen people playing our game at lunch and I think that's super cool. That's super cool. <laughs> so. Okay, I've, I've downloaded it but I can't get it out of bootloader mode. So, okay, we'll try again later. Huh? Turn it off and turn it on again. Turn it off and turn it on again. Thank you. No, it's still, it's still, I think maybe because it's on the, on the bootloader. Oh, that's too bad. Well, it's there, believe me. Oh. Okay, so anyway, we put something, we put, let me just try it one more time. And I'm not getting saved by the make code team. What? Get off beta? I'm on beta. I'm on beta. Oh, I see. I'm playing, uh, really? Okay, well, well let's try, okay. okay. I'll take, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take a hint. Okay, we'll try it again. One more time, Raptor run. Okay, we're gonna hit download again. We're gonna select the Pi badge. Okay, we also have um, connectivity uh, via web USB. Uh, so if you have web, web USB, uh, you can uh, actually connect to the device through the browser directly and, and avoid the file copy. Okay, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're okay. Well, let's see if this is gonna work. Okay, second time's a charm, right? Folder. Badge boot. Okay, drag and drop via finger does not work. Mouse is not present. Everything going to hell. <laughs> Common collected. Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't have a mouse or anything now. Uh, oh, and it went away. No, everything. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, hold on, hold on. This has got to work now after that. Gosh, okay. Oh, can you see it? <laughs> Come on, get the camera on me. Here, we can prove it out. You, do, you play it. Okay, can you play it? I just died. She just died, okay. That's good, I guess, okay. <laughs> so how do we get here? Uh, uh, space and time are really important, right? And turns out these processors have very little memory, but they have a lot more time. They're quite fast compared to my Apple II, 
but they have about they have less memory than my Apple II did, right? So, static TypeScript, we get rid of all the dynamic mechanisms. Well, most of them that um, that would require us, for example, to put the compiler on the board, like eval. Um, other interpreters, uh, Python, MicroPython, CircuitPython, they actually can compile, you know, your text right on on the, uh, the microcontroller. Um, we get rid of eval, we get with, rid of prototype-based inheritance, there's no prototype chain, and we treat classes uh, as traditional uh, 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 abstractions like C-sharp. C so classes are not dynamically extensible, you can't cast it to any, well you can, uh, and add a property, you'll get a runtime uh, error. So we have runtime type tagging, we have a set of distinct types in our runtime, we have a V table, traditional V table uh, for time and space efficiency of our classes. Uh, and most everyone who comes to uh, the microcontroller space uh, has been writing in C++ and they, they just see this stuff and they just write sort of traditional object oriented code. Uh, all the strangeness in JavaScript and monkey patching and stuff, it won't work here and for the most part people don't care because the sort of code they're writing is, is, is in this very constrained space. We do quite a bit to optimize. We do traditional sort of 31-bit integer optimization. So we use the uh, pointers are word aligned. So we use the lower two bits to play around and, and get more efficiency with integers and, and runtime type tags. Uh, and as a result, we get, uh, we get decent enough performance. Uh, we also are extending over time to add more JavaScript and TypeScript features. So we just added exceptions. Um, there's uh, use of the any type, uh, at the very beginning of static TypeScript, we were very strict, there was no any uh, at all. And now um, uh, we have uh, more bindings, shorthand properties, computed property names. So over time, we're getting more and more uh, towards JavaScript, but we're still using, we're still sort of keeping the control flow more static uh, and, and limiting the ability, uh, keeping classes distinct from essentially the object, uh, object. So we do have extensible maps, uh, as you would expect, but they're not, they're, they're not in the same space uh, uh, of objects as classes. Classes are distinct. Uh, here's some performance numbers. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have some programs that we wrote. Uh, we wrote them in C, and here's, here's the timing on various runs of uh, Binary Tree, uh, Richards, some n-body simulation. Uh, here are the slowdowns over GCC for a number of uh, interpreted approaches. And so you see generally hundreds of times slowdown uh, for these. Uh, here's uh, the, the JIT, here's, uh, here's V8 on node. You can see for N body, it starts off very slow because it only gets uh, 1K uh, iterations. And it, the more time you give it, the better the code gets. And here's the slowdown for static TypeScript. Uh, so you see relative to the interpreted approaches on board, uh, we're, we're quite a bit faster. Um, and uh, we're not uh, so bad uh, compared, uh, compared to V8. But, you know, we can't, we can't compete, obviously, uh, with the, uh, the uh, tracing-based uh, uh, tracing compiler or the dynamic compiler. We also have a VM, which gives us uh, better space, uh, better code size. Uh, you take a hit in the runtime. Uh, here, this was running here on a Pi Zero, so we could run Node. Uh, here's a board with 96 kilobytes of RAM that you're never going to really run Node on, I think. So here are the times for the GCC, uh, GCC'd C program. Uh, you see many of the interpreted approaches getting out of memory, uh, whereas uh, we're, we're uh, uh, doing pretty uh, decently, I would say, for a non-optimizing compiler uh, compared to GCC. So uh, static TypeScript is really there to uh, try to achieve uh, some space savings through the V table, uh, as well as uh, a com compiling ahead of time uh, for, uh, for, better, uh, for better runtime efficiency. You can see uh, the code that's actually generated uh, if you go down uh, in the JavaScript editor, uh, again, back to, uh, uh, back to the Explore, and you go all the way down here to built, and down there, there's an ASM file. So we actually produce readable thumb assembly in the browser. So if you really wanted to, I mean, you could open up our, our open source and like 
edit assembly and add assembly into the whole mix too. In fact, we did that in the early days. So we have a compiler from static TypeScript, which is based on the TypeScript compiler in the browser, to an intermediate representation. From that, we target both JavaScript, which in continuation passing style, which is run in the simulator. Uh, then we target thumb assembler as well as this VM, and we have an assembler from thumb to machine code and a linker to the blob that is the C++ binary where we know where the locations of the entry points are that were determined by all that metadata, which I didn't so show you for the C++. So all in all, uh, a lot of great compiler and technology uh, work by the team to make this happen uh, and, and really broad use in the schools these days. Uh, so what, I, what, I've, uh, what I've shown you here is uh, through MakeCode and Arcade, we're really trying to bridge uh, the gap between this uh, the world of the web browser and JavaScript and TypeScript, where you have a lot of RAM generally, you have uh, JavaScript, you have these great frameworks like Blockly to do, uh, to do editing in a drag and drop way. And then at the bottom, uh, you have this microcontroller, which has you know, 16K of RAM, there's no operating system, it's bare metal, uh, and you want to write uh, you know, device drivers in it and not have uh, memory conflicts and things like that, uh, and you have the problems of C and, and C++. So I think what we've done here uh, is something very interesting, uh, which, is, which is to take the subset of TypeScript and uh, with MakeCode put it in the middle. I did want to say, uh, since we have just a uh, uh, second there, we also have a whole extension story. We had uh, somebody earlier saying, oh yeah, let's just, uh, let's just bring, um, let's just bring uh, JavaScript more directly into TypeScript. I thought that was a nice idea. Um, what if you want to add something? So we have a whole extension story, and these extensions are just TypeScript written uh, on GitHub that you can import. Uh, we have a whitelist here, but you can write your own uh, extensions. Uh, so for example, uh, we have an extension, uh, we have an extension for the meow bit here, which has an edge connector, which is inspired by the micro bit. Uh, and if you find that edge connector, which is here somewhere, uh, where did my edge connector go? Where go? Yeah, yeah, keyboard, rather. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah. Oh, it's in beta. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going to show you another one. So uh, we bring the keyboard in, and what, what it's doing is it's dynamically loading from GitHub uh, a, new, uh, a new namespace, and that namespace has TypeScript, and that TypeScript will be compiled and put onto the board as I need it. Um, so anyway, uh, we should stop there. Uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for your time. I want to thank uh, Holly as well for being a great uh, early user. And if you have more uh, questions about the language, uh, we can answer them here, or you can go to this URL. Hi, uh, I have a question about uh, when you were adding the program into, you mentioned that there was kind of a way that you simulated that it's a uh, USB storage, does it only take in like one of that, one type of that extension or, or how do you do that uh, so the file management? The bootloader uh, supports both sort of the Arduino files and these UF2 files. So um, it expects certain file types and it's sort of a, a write only file system. Although, yeah, it's a very simple file system. It, it, it's prepared to accept files of certain types and others it'll just say, oh yeah, yeah, I'll write that to disk and it just, it just gets rid of it. So um, it's all open source. We basically support the Arduino format. Um, our Adafruit has adopted UF2 for most of its boards um, because it's, uh, it's designed the, the size of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the data uh, elements is such that um, they're aligned with flash. So unlike hex files from Intel, uh, the the, there's nothing to decode. And it's a much, much faster operation without the need for buffering. Um, but essentially, yeah, it is masquerading as a file system. It, it actually can present files back, but the, you're really just, uh, you're really just uh, filling up. The, the goal of the format is to fill up the flash on the device. So that's the primary goal. Uh, does static TypeScript have the same semantics as real TypeScript? Like if you were to take compiled, or take a TypeScript program for this device and run it in a browser, would it behave exactly the same way? Right, and we do that. So the question is, will it behave the same? And yes, it will uh, in the sense that um, 
there, but there will be sort of less errors on the JavaScript side because uh, if we do sort of the, the straightforward erasure, then, um, then the JavaScript semantics is more permissive than what we have in the hardware. In the hardware doing runtime type checking and we will fail operations, right? That won't be failed. So basically uh, every successful trace in static TypeScript on the hardware will be a trace uh, up uh, of the same kind in, uh, in JavaScript land, but not the other way around, right? Um, so, but, but as much as possible, uh, we try to bring all the runtime, when we do our compilation, we insert runtime checks in the JavaScript to, we want the semantics to be the same. It's mm, not quite there, but yeah, we, we do have, we do have a, a slightly different semantics, but we will have this sort of one way, uh, this one way containment. The JavaScript is more permissive. The semantics is more permissive. Oh, the order of operations is the same. Yeah, as much as possible, we try to, yeah, we try to, yeah. Uh, uh, I can hear you, I can repeat. Okay, you can repeat. Um, TypeScript as a programming language is self-hosting. Is static uh, TypeScript? Oh, stat no, we don't, write in, we don't write our compiler in static TypeScript, if that's what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly possible, but we, we, uh, we really like TypeScript, so we, we uh, use that compiler, uh, and we, we have no desire right now to try to put static TypeScript it, itself onto the board as a compiler, you know, <laughs> Not a non-goal. Okay, yeah. anything else? Thank you again. Thanks. Oh, and... We have um, Daryl, uh, who saved me there, and um, Richard uh, will be downstairs. We have a bunch of the boards, uh, some browsers you can play. You can see the micro bits um, and the other devices we have. So please uh, come on downstairs when we have uh, a time a break. Cool. Well, Thank you so much. Okay, one more question. This is a beautiful question. Thank you. Will it work with non-Windows machines? Yes. As long as you have a modern web browser, it works on Linux, Chromebooks, it works on Mac OS. We even have Bluetooth flashing, so it'll work on iOS for the micro bit. Yeah, it, it just, you just need a modern web browser, and for the um, USB thing, you need a mass storage device. Every operating system really supports that. Yeah, so as much as possible, this was born out of the classroom experience. We don't know what computers we're gonna find in classrooms, so yeah, it's, uh, it's w pretty much sort of lowest common denominator technology, which these days for modern would be the web browser and a USB, USB interface. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.